Well, hello there, family and friends. It's good to see you again. And what are we going to be chatting about today? Well, I've been watching a few videos. And it came to my mind. Well, not my mind. It was Trixie's mind. She was watching them with me. And she slapped me with a paw and said, Papa, this just ain't right. You know better than this. So, what we're going to be talking about is some gardening myths. Are they fact or are they a myth? And what we're looking at right here is my Kentucky Wonder pole beans I was growing in 2019. Oh yeah. And they're looking fine. Yeah. Disregard, you know, a couple of bad leaves there. We pluck them off, which I would suggest you do. And if you don't know it, it was these Kentucky Wonder beans along with my rattlesnake pole beans that were going up, up by the old uh, clothesline planting area that crossed and made now my hybrid Kentucky Wonder slash rattlesnake pole beans that I now grow or started growing in 2020 and will continue to grow in hopes that they uh, continue to stabilize. So Something I've said in many videos, as well as this froggy person did, I won't mention his name, I love froggy, was when you plant garden beans or peas, when I say beans, they can be green beans, pole beans, bush beans, or they can be uh, any type of garden peas, you know, English peas, those are green ones in the south, we call them English peas. Why? Because southern peas are such things as old black-eyed, purple hole peas, crowder, uh, clay, you know, they're uh, more of a southern type pea because English peas here in the south struggle, especially in the spring because our springs are so short and things get hot really quick. And if you're going to plant English peas in the south, it's better to do them in the late fall and grow them out through early winter. Just saying. But something I've always said, and Foggy also said in one of his videos, was, you know, your beans or your peas will add nitrogen to your soil, which is a good thing, right? And I've said just the same thing. Now, as we were watching this particular video, Trixie reminded me, you knew better, old man, than this a long time ago. And she was exactly right. So is it a fact that uh, growing beans, whether they be green beans or English peas or uh, southern peas, black eyes and purple holes or crowd or what have you in the garden, do they in fact? Add nitrogen to your soil. Is that a fact? Or is it more of a myth? And like I said, at one time in my life, I knew better. You know, back when I was gardening and farming with my daddy, my grandpa, and uh, my own farming experience. So what we're going to be doing now is we're going to take a look into that. And we're actually going to see if it is fact or myth. Right now in the comments, you can put down what you believe. Don't wait till I tell you. Put it on down there. Type it on in. Put what you think out there. So, let's continue. And let me show you just what we're talking about today. So, here we are at the first site that we're going to be uh, previewing and reading talk about this and it's gardenmist.com greens add nitrogen slash soil and it says right here do greens add nitrogen to the soil it says the legume is commonly recommended as a companion plant it is believed that the excess nitrogen produced by the legume will help feed the companion growing next to it in the Three Sisters agricultural system, the bean provides the nitrogen for the corn to grow 
since corn needs a lot of nitrogen, it grows better. Now, I'll stop right there. I don't know how many times I've revisited the three sisters growing method. And I gotta admit, I've never seen a measurable difference in my corn. I'm just saying. Now, in my thoughts, our Native American ancestors and my brothers may have been growing it for different reasons. They may have been, like I have in the past, been utilizing those nice, straight, strong corn stalks to support the beans. Yeah, that makes perfect sense because I've done it. It works. No problem. But there's timing to do that. You got to let that corn get up about a foot, foot and a half or two before you stick them beans in there. Same is sort of kind of true with that squash. You plant that squash too early, it will shade out the little tiny corn plants. And I've watched hundreds of people, maybe even more, plant all three at the same time. And I have done that too, years and years ago. And I found that squash will definitely shade out the corn. In fact, I did the same thing either in 2018 or 2019. Had one of the poorest uh, sweet corn crops ever in my life. Because what happened? I planted butternut squash down through there, same time I planted the corn, and the same time I did the beans. And what happened was, well, the corn came up, but squash outgrew it, shaded out the corn, and then the beans grabbed the whole, whole of the corn, which was already struggling, and just strangled it. And I didn't wind up with much of a harvest. But anyway, that's just me. Maybe you've had better success. Maybe you can tell me down in the comments. In all truth, comments are where we all learn so much more. Makes it all more better. The greens are also an important ingredient in crop rotation. Grow corn one year, follow that up with beans and peas for the following year to restore the level of nitrogen in the soil. And this is a common practice throughout the Midwest, uh, even the high plain states and throughout many of our major corn growing areas they plant corn one year they follow by beans next year's corn and all that and you say well mr tom if indeed and these are soybeans by the way that are normally planted sometimes it's chickpeas and why do they do that well that's what we're going to be discussing you see, there's no doubt that legumes are able to capture atmospheric nitrogen using bacteria. And this is going to be very important and convert it to plant usable nitrogen. But how much of this actually benefits other plants? Are legumes a good source of nitrogen for the garden? So we come on down here and we're going to discuss legumes and nitrification. And the reason I like this site because it don't get too all sciencey like the university ones do. The greens, including beans and peas, are able to have a symbiotic relationship with a specific family of bacteria called rhizobia, or rhizobio. Not sure how you pronounce that. The plant roots form nodules, little bones, which house the bacteria. The nodules provide protection for the bacteria, and the root provides them with the sugars as a food source. In return, the bacteria take atmospheric nitrogen, which plants can use, and through a process called nitrogen fixation, they convert it to ammonia. The ammonia is converted to a nitrate as it is absorbed by the plants. Now I want to stop right here, because when we were watching Froggy, and that, once he uh, had picked off his peas and decided he was done with them, he ripped those suckers out of the ground. Oh yeah. And I've seen this so many times on YouTube, not to, in, not to mention other social media platforms. So, if, it, if indeed the greens, beans, peas, were fixing the nitrogen, we all wrong now. It's in the roots. And if you rip them on out, uh, what's happening then? 
Yeah, some of the roots stay behind. But as you could see from his video and so many others, the majority of the nitrogen is now heading to your compost pile, which in effect is not a bad thing either. So the plant is then able to use nitrogen to make proteins and other molecules. This process is well understood and is not up for debate. However, what is much less clear is how does this fixed nitrogen become available to other plants in what quantities and when. And then they got a little note here, not all of Gweems make nodules and some scientists believe not all of Gweems are able to fix nitrogen. Others believe there is non-nodulating way for some plants to fix nitrogen. So there you go. Even the scientists don't always agree. Most garden writers just assume that a lot of this nitrogen flows to other plants for them to use. So we got here nitrogen from live laguine. Does nitrogen move from the laguine plant to neighbor plants while the gleam is still alive? This must be true if nitrogen is a benefit to a companion plant. The answer to the question has not been fully answered by science. Some research suggests that nitrogen does move from one plant to others growing nearby. In one study, broad beans were injected with a radioactive urea. Yep. They were nuked to see where it goes. The garlic growing nearby absorbed some of the nitrogen from the bean clearly showing it moved while both plants were alive. See, this would be a good thing, right? It's all, amount, it's all about the amount, and we'll be discussing that as we continue. Other research has shown no movement of nitrogen between plants. This movement may depend on environmental conditions, types of plants, types of soil, nutrient levels in the soil, or other unknown conditions. See, it's getting complicated. We don't have a definitive answer, but if nitrogen does move from the gleams to other plants, it is almost certain that the amount is small because most studies can't find any movement at all. The gleams keep most of the nitrogen. They can use it themselves. And that's something I want to say. When you plant beans or peas, they're not putting nitrogen in the soil to benefit other plants they're putting it in there they're pulling it from the atmosphere storing it in the roots for their own very selfish reasons and you'll see that as we continue so where does a legume store nitrogen some insights to this can be found in designing and maintaining your edible landscape naturally by Rob Coolrick which shows a bean plant and its relative nitrogen levels you got a little diagram down here. Okay. Percent of fixed nitrogen. The seed. The green, no flowers, fleshy green. The green, mature pods, dry foliage. I want you to think about this. Now, as you can see here on the left, the seed, well, there are no seed because it's no flowers, fleshy green. The leaves and stems, 60%. The roots, 40%. As green manure, 50%. Let's talk about that right now. If you, and this is something I used to know and I forgot, when using beans or peas for nitrogen building in the soil. See right here? As green manure, 50%. Well, back working with my grandpa and my daddy, and when we did grow such things as peas, and I'm talking southern peas, which were a big thing in the south to improve uh, soil tilth and nitrogen levels in the soil. In fact, actually, at one time, the federal government gave them away to farmers. This was primarily after the Dust Bowl and promoted them. See right there? 50% of uh, the nitrogen as green manure, which means if you come through with a mower, before they set the bean pods, you're going to get 50% of the nitrogen by mowing it down and letting it fall on the ground. 50% is in the form of bacteria and nodules. Yep. 
of course now here's the thing to remember they haven't set any beans yet and they're not developing the beans now if you go over here to Laguin mature pods dry foliage this is if you were raising them for uh, uh, dry beans of course now you gotta understand picking them green it's going to be relative just in different amounts so the seeds gonna have 70 to 90 percent of the nitrogen the plant fixed in the seeds and what has been found is that a, an average of 80 percent of all the nitrogen fixed by beans and peas once you allow them to grow the beans i.e. a food crop instead of a nitrogen fixing cover crop where you mow them on down before they set the beans and peas it's going to be sent to the seeds the leaves and stems which used to have 60 percent now only have six to ten percent the roots now instead of having 40 percent now only have three to six percent as a green manure meaning if you mowed them down the beans on them and everything five to twenty percent yeah so there it is in a green plant before flowering 60 percent of the fixed nitrogen is found above the ground in leaves and stem and 40 percent below the ground the same plant with mature pods has 80 percent of the plants fixed nitrogen in the seed 80 percent nine percent in the leaves and stem the remainder in the roots well don't take a genius to figure out that's only 11 percent left in those roots and rip those suckers out well you ain't even got that nine percent anymore are your leguines nodulating in order for leguines to form nodules and the host the bacteria the bacteria needs to be present in the soil now it is present in some soils and in others not and there are different species of rhizobia or rhizobia different types of leguines if your soil does not contain the right strain no nodules will form and i've seen this actually in my experience over all the decades of gardening and farming Gardeners solve this problem by inoculating the seed with the right bacteria at the time of planting. Little packs of bacteria can be purchased from seed companies that you can also buy seed that is already coated with the right bacteria. And I know in any online reputable seed seller, as well as I've seen it in Walmart, I've seen it at Home Depot and Lowe's, they'll have little packets of uh, inoculate yep and if you don't do that then you can't be insured that your beans are even going to set very much if any nitrogen see once the bacteria is in the soil it will survive there for several years so even a four-year crop rotation does not to be inoculated each time so let's say we all went out 2021 and inoculated our beans and peas and that would be good to go well probably we'd be good to go from now for a year or two maybe three possibly four so it's not like an every year thing uh, granted that you're growing beans or peas in relatively the same spot it's not like you inoculate your beans and peas put them like i put them up there in the clothesline pole plant and then uh this year i'm putting them down by the south fence it ain't like the bacteria can travel that far. Their legs ain't that long. Come on. So how do you know if you have the right bacteria in the soil? Grow the leguine and have a look at the roots halfway through the summer or in the fall. Yep. You can dig them up. Shake the dirt off. Take a look at them. You ain't got no nodules. It ain't happening. You can easily see the pea-sized nodules. If they are there, and they are most visible as the plant blooms so that's when you dig them up yeah if you're going food you're going to want to hate to do this 
So maybe you plant two or three or four just so you can. If the plant did not make nodules, you either do not have the right bacteria in the soil or you have too much nitrogen. Yeah. If you throw them down high nitrogen fertilizer, you see the plant don't got to do that. Don't got to be, you know, gather its own nitrogen. Plants are lazy just like us. So they don't have to do it. They ain't going. See, excess fertilizer will prevent the formation of nodules since the plant simply does not need the bacteria. And even though the bacteria is probably staying around on its little tiny legs with little placards going, we want to make back nitrogen, the plant goes, I don't need y'all. Okay? So nitrogen from dead leguines. As discussed above, living leguines provide very little nitrogen to the soil or other plants. Once a leguine dies, the nitrogen in the plant is returned to the soil. Where decomposers, here again, that's that bacteria and fungi, convert the organic matter into free nitrogen ions. Like nitrate, which can be used by other plants. This all sounds great, but the story is a bit more complex. See, the guims use most of the nitrogen it obtained to produce seeds. The beans and the peas. I mean, come on. We don't work so somebody else can prosper. We work so we can prosper. You know, us, our kids, family. Well, beans are the same way. They ain't uh, gathering up the nitrogen from the atmosphere to share or leave behind. They're gathering up the nitrogen so they can produce their beans and seeds, whether it be green beans, whether you let them dry, whether you're doing peas, or what have you. Yeah, it's so they can reproduce and survive. So, if you harvest the seeds or any part of the plant, you are removing most of the nitrogen before it gets to the soil. In fact, the residue from a corn crop, a non green contains more nitrogen than the residue from a bean crop Simply because the corn has more residue. Yeah. Sure does. And when they say harvesting the beans, it's just like soybeans. They come in the combine and take all the beans off, which have, you know, up to 80% of the nitrogen. But, now they don't rip out the plants. Uh, not anymore. They don't plow. Pretty much everything with the big commercial farmers is no-till. Which makes total sense because they don't want them to go across that field anymore than what they have. Now, forage crops that have harvested and removed from the land provide almost no nitrogen for future plants because the roots and crowns add little soil nitrogen compared to the above ground biomass. And we're talking about hay and uh, different crops like clovers, alfalfa, and everything that's baled to feed animals. About 80% of the plant's nitrogen is found above ground, like we already know. The other issue is one of time. Organic matter takes time to decompose. The rule of thumb is that organic matter decomposes slowly over a five year period with some nutrients being constantly released. This is okay for a long term gardener. But if you think that the gleam will provide a lot of nitrogen for next year's crop, you are wrong. That just makes sense. Anybody who composts knows this. In composting, because it heats up, you got the bugs in there, you got the fungus and all that going on in the pile, and if you turn it, we already know. That speeds it up. But just having it lay on top of the ground, oh, it takes a while. And even if you till it in. There is some shorter term nitrogen release from the guims. As the plant grows, it might shed the nodules as it grows new roots or matures. These discarded nodules are a quicker source of nitrogen for the soil. So leguines and compliant pan. Leguines are highly touted as a great companion plant because they add nitrogen to the soil for partner plants. This is simply not true. They may provide a reasonable amount of nitrogen in future years, provided you don't harvest a crop from them. But as a companion plant, they fail to meet expectations. The gleams and crop rotation. The gleams can provide a good source of nitrogen in future years, provided you don't harvest crop from them. So a leguine cover crop 
makes a lot of sense since all the nitrogen is returned to the soil. This is why back after the dust bowl, when our soil was so poor, so eroded, so nutrient uh, deficient, the federal government went around and gave seed and paid people to plant stuff like clay and pigeon peas, crowded peas, and black eye purple walls, whatever, which became staples in the South, as well as uh, the Midwest. Keep in mind, this is a good long-term strategy for building up nutrients in the soil, not a short-term strategy. And then it covers here clovers and lawns, which, you know, I'm all about. And clovers, says right here, clover, and I've even seen people put clover in their gardens, in the pathways. And I was thought, well, that's a great idea. And I've even done that. And I oversee Dutch clover in my lawns, thinking, well, the clover fixes nitrogen. It benefits the grass. Everything's good. And, of course, the clover finally dies out. Uh... All the green of it, the tops die, but the roots seem to uh, survive somehow and come back next spring. For my lawns, back when I cared about a lawn, now I'm more about wild and free than manicured and uh, the lawn looking great. The idea that clover is synonymous with lots of nitrogen is a myth. Cutting the clover will add some green plant material to the lawn, but the same happens when grass is cut. Plants add some future nitrogen as materials decompose the lawn, and I've known that forever. That's why, and I back him up, you know, my grass clippings, but I keep a set of mulching blades on instead of high back. If you got high backs on, oh, 95, 98% goes up to shoot into the backs. But with mulching blades, they don't create that same wind that uh, the high back blades do. They may get about 50, 60 percent at best up into the bags. So I'm still leaving some to feed the grass, feed the trees, okay? And just like it says here, does the Three Sisters Agriculture work? I discussed this more, Three Sisters Agriculture. The part of the story where the bean provides the nitrogen for the corn is a myth. As we've learned as we went through this article. Okay? But it ain't going to, you know, old Mr. Tom, he don't just stop here. He's going to take a look at a university's opinion on it. And the one I'm going to be showing you is not the only one I've read. Lord, when I get into something, I dig with a shovel, a pick, and an axe. And I read a bunch of them. Many as I can find until I just get tired of it. Until I know Whatever it is, like this myth here, and it is a myth now. You can see right now, just based on this, and as we go a little bit further into it, for those of you who are still with me, hopefully some are that really care about gardening or farming, we'll see. It's more of a myth than it is a fact. So let's head on over and see what the brain trust at one, and there are many, you can do your own research, and I hope you do. I like to check out what the universities have to say. Not just what some uh, blog post, social media, or blog has to say about things. And this is just one of them. This is from Texas A&M. And that, I was sort of thinking of my baby brother down in Texas, you know, Les, North Star Pioneer, you know, him and Teresa. Which got it going on in their gardening too. So, we look at them. Because when I dig, I dig deep. When I see a video that says something that I may question, I got to go dig up the dirt. See what's really going on. And this one from uh, Texas A&M says nitrogen fixation. And what they're saying is true. Nitrogen is the most limiting nutrient for plant growth. A legume plant's ability to use nitrogen for the air is the best known benefit of growing legumes, but the least understood. Approximately 79% of the air is nitrogen gas. You can look that up. 
However, it's not in the form that plants can use. In reality, it's not the plant that removes nitrogen from the air, but the rhizobium or rhizobium bacteria, which live in a small tumor-like structures called nodules on the Leguin plant roots. And the bacteria can take the nitrogen gas from the air in the soil and transform it into ammonia, NH3, that converts to ammonium, NH4, which can be used by the plant. See, without, without the bacteria, you ain't, you ain't getting the process done. And being a process engineer, I know all about process. This ammonium is the same form as in ammonium nitrate, 3400, which was, until people started using it to blow everything up, the most uh, common and available form of nitrogen in the U.S. Now, it's hard to get. Now you got to use ammonium sulfate, which ain't quite as good as that ammonium nitrate, 34.00. It's only 21.00. And if you're out there buying it, from regardless of who you buy it from, you're going to find it's about 21.00 or 20.00. About all the best you're going to find. And so the process between the Leguin plant and the rhizobium Bacteria is referred to as a symbiotic. That's mutual beneficial relationship. Sort of like man and woman in a marriage. It should be symbiotic, right? If it ain't, then you need to readjust your thinking. Because, you know, plants understand, unlike people, that it takes two to tango. Now, each organism receives something from the other gives back something in return. The rhizobia bacteria provides the guine plant with nitrogen in the form of ammonia. And the guine plant provides the bacteria with carbohydrates as an energy source. See, the plants are feeding their bacteria buddies. The rate of N2 fixation is directly related to the guine plant growth rate. Anything that reduces plant growth such as drought, low temperature, limited plant nutrients, or disease, will also reduce the N2 fixation. Maintaining sufficient leaf area in the Leguine stand to intercept most of the sunlight is also critical to maintaining a growth rate to support N2 fixation. And they got this, and that's why I brought this article up more or less, was because of this here nice little picture here. So, like I said, Froggy pulled his up. When he did, you see these little nodules on the roots? Well, they were probably knocked off and hopefully left in the soil. Who knows? So, I, I used to pull bean plants up too. Long time ago, before my dad slapped me on the back of the head and said, Don't do that. Just cut them off at the base and leave them in there. We'll till it all in when we bring the rototillers through. But see, you can see them right here. And this is exactly what happens. And if you want to see if your bean or pea plants are fixing nitrogen, you can do this right as they start to bloom. Go ahead and dig them up and see if indeed they've been forming nodules. If they're not, then you didn't do something right. You didn't inoculate them with the right bacteria or what have you whatever you plant. And see, the N2 fixation process itself is influenced by soil temperature. See, research for white clover indicates an optimum temperature range from 55 to 80 Fahrenheit, with sharp declines in N2 fixation above and below this range. No N2 fixation occurred below soil temperatures of 48 F. And see, I'm since we're talking about clover here, if you live here in the south, you'll know clover don't come up till it gets sort of kind of warm. And then once it gets above 80, it dies on out. Or at least the above ground portion of it does. The roots are still there. So whatever uh, nitrogen they fixed, is still there for the lawn. Or in your garden, if you're doing it in pathways. And see, 
The quantity of nitrogen fixed by Leguines can range from almost none to over 200 pounds per acre. Factors that influence the quantity of nitrogen fixed are the level of soil nitrogen, the rhizobia, strain infecting the guim, amount of plant growth, how the guim is managed, and the length of the growing season. If given a choice, the guim plant will remove nitrogen from the soil before obtaining nitrogen from the air through N2 fixation. A guim growing on sandy soil, very low in nitrogen, get most of its nitrogen from there. While a laguin growing on fertile river bomb soil get most of its nitrogen from the soil. General estimates of the amount of nitrogen fixed range from 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre for annuals and about 200 pounds nitrogen acre per alfalfa. Now I'm not going to read through this whole article. I will leave a link to it in the description below the video like I do with all links. And that so you can go on through it, okay? Because it's lengthy, it's scientific, and it'll just bore your brains out if you're not all that interested. But down here at the bottom, it says the root system and unused leaves and stems of annual leguines die at plant maturity and are de decomposed by soil, soil microbes over time. Nitrogen contained in this plant material is released over time and available to other plants. However, because most of this nitrogen is not available until the laguine dies, only grasses that follow the laguine growing season can use it. This is a major nitrogen transfer pathway for cool season annual laguines overseeded on warm season perennial grasses because the clover growing period occurs before the warm season growing. And this is some about clover, not so much about beans and the queens. They also talk about run livestock on it. And we used to do that. And I hadn't thought about this in a long time. But in our pastures, and I don't see this much of anywhere in YouTube, nobody seems to improve their pastures. They're just weedy, wild, not very good. But what Papa used to do, that was my daddy, my father, and my grandfather, they interplanted certain things into the pastures. I seen daddy plant clover. Here in the south is red clover. Up in PA in New York, it was more Dutch clover into the pasture. They drill it in. They go to uh, then, if they didn't own a seed drill, they'd go to the co-op and uh, borrow one. That used to be a thing. I'm not sure if it's a thing anymore whether you can do that or not or whether you got to own your own. And back when I was farming, hence I used to know all this and forgot it over time, I used to do the same thing. Because, just like it says, the primary pathways for nitrogen transfer from the guim to the soil are through grazing livestock and decomposition of dead laguine plant material. When the laguine forage is consumed by grazing livestock, from 80 to 90 percent of nitrogen in that forage passes through the animal is extruded in the urine and feces. Now, let's say you have a homestead or home place uh, and you can't have cattle. What are you going to do? Well, a lot of you out there, especially on YouTube, it seems like Everybody that's got, you know, postage stamp yard, one-tenth of an acre or what have you, has chickens. Well, if you plant clover in your chicken yard, or if you're smart and you got, can move your uh, chicken pen or tractors over your garden area, throw in some uh, clover, or even some type of leguines, peas, beans, or what have you, and let them grow up, pull in chicken tractors, and let the chickens have that, not only will it be nutritious for the chickens, but the chickens too will process all that plant matter 
those luscious beans and peas and through its system they will go and come out in their manure already ready to go and increase the nitrogen in your soil of course we already all know chicken poop is highly nitrogen it will burn plants if you put it right on without composting it and you need to compost it at least one year now I've seen people still do it and it will kill your garden plants that's why rabbit manure is so pure chicken manure is considered a hot manure because of the high nitrogen content and it's so readily accessible to the plants. You know, it's just like a dog comes up and uh, pees on a plant. The plant will die. Why? Because urine, whether it's dogs, kitties, or Mr. Tom's or yours, is also a high nitrogen source. You can look that up. Yeah, it may be disgusting. But there are many people in many areas of the world that rather than go to the bathroom and the toilet, they save that urine. And they use it to fertilize their plants. And I'll tell you a secret. I've done it too. And I put it down on my corn. And the times I have, even though the wife complained proficiently, I had some of the best corn I've ever had in my life. Of course, I didn't have that much because you can only save so much up. And it's got to be in a sealed container, but as soon as you pop it off to add some more, it's rather smelly. So that's up to you whether that's what you want to do. Now, I've even seen people, when they moved their outhouses, this is back in the day, when outhouses were uh, a thing, they dig out that outhouse after a year, some years, and they'd use that to fertilize their garden. Oh, yeah, they surely would. I'm sure most of us ain't going to get down in the outhouse pit and uh, shovel that out. But I will tell you, there's been a time or two back in my early years when I did just that. So, as you can see, nitrogen fixation from uh, growing beans and peas is starting to look a little questionable. That it's a major contributor to uh, nitrogen availability in the soil after you plant any type of green, whether that be beans or peas. But let's take a look at a sustainability website. You know, and I have one that, you know, I follow along with many because I actually was part of the sustainability movement back in the late 80s and early 90s, back when we had nothing but books. And there weren't many back then about organic gardening or farming. We had Mother Earth News. If you don't know Mother Earth News, that's still a thing. And I would advise you to go over there and bookmark their website. I have, oh Lord, I don't know how many Mother Earth News magazines I got saved up. And we had Rodale Press. Then Rodale Press ain't a thing no more, but you can still get books by them. And they're still relevant to today. And I had that. I had my Mother Earth News when I went to Southern Tennessee and bought my first farm. A four, well, it's 11 acres of usable land, 14 acres total. And even though it was called truck farm back then, it be a relative day to what they call a market garden point. Oh yeah. I raised a ton of vegetables of all kinds and I tried to sell them to people but they were organic. No pesticides, no uh, commercial fertilizers. Well, back then nobody cared. People just cared about price. So I wound up selling them to grocery stores in the local area and actually supplied all three uh, grocery stores that were in our small 
southern Tennessee town. That was Fayetteville, Tennessee, by the way, in Lincoln County. It became, white, became quite well known for it, too, I might add. So I was successful, but it took a whole lot of work, a whole lot of cow manure, a whole lot of cover crops, a whole lot of compost. Lord knows I had compost piles up 20 feet high at times. Uh, but let's go over here to a website that's all about organic sustainability and see what they got to say about beans and peas and nitrogen fixation. Okay? So here we are at the final site that I'm taking you to. And like I always encourage you, please go do your own research. Just don't depend on old Mr. Tom or any other social media platform or mainstream media platform for whatever you decide. Do your own research. Take some time. The best time to do that, of course, is in the winter time. And here we are at treehugger.com. Yep, and I'll put this in the description below the video as well. So if you want to check them all out, which I suggest you do, you can. Another site, briefly now, I'll say again, is Mother Earth News. Yep. And if you want to uh, be a subscriber to them, get their magazine, by all means do. I got hundreds of those things stored away. God knows what will happen to them after I go away. Hopefully my daughter, doubt my son will, will keep them and read through them sometimes. She loves to read. Maybe Davy too. So, like they say, tree hugger here is sustainability for all. And they've been around since 2004. Unlike mother, mother been around since, oh, when I was organic gardening and farming all the way back in the late 70s, early 80s. So, it says right here, how nitrogen fiction plants can perk up your garden. It says here, are you an ecologically sensitive garden? Well, I hope most of us are. We're growing things that give back to the environment and make your heart skip a beat. If the answers are yes, then get ready to fall in love with nitrogen fixing plants of the Laguine family. That's beans and peas, pole beans, bush beans, English peas, or southern peas, or clovers, or even alfalfa. Oh, yeah. Laguines, beans, peas, non edible relatives such as clovers. Get back to your garden because they have a symbiotic relationship with soil bacteria. This special relationship allows them to convert atmospheric nitrogen into, into ammonium nitrogen. You know, that's ones that the plants can use, which they release into the soil. This is a big deal for tomatoes, broccoli, peppers, and other common plants in the backyard vegetable gardens. That's because most plants can absorb atmospheric nitrogen which is an inert gas. They need to absorb nitrogen, an essential building block for all plants, from the soil through the roots. The way for home gardeners to take advantage of the organic nitrogen fixing capabilities of legumes and reduce the reliance on chemical fertilizer is not to grow food crops. This is key. Do not grow food crops, such as beans and peas, said Julia Gaskin, a sustainable agriculture coordinator at the University of Georgia. Yep, right here in the southeast. You know, we're some smart people when it comes to farming. Rather, she said, you should grow legumes as cover crops in advance of food crops. Cover crops are things that we plant in the garden to promote ecosystem services, said Gaskin. In the case of the legumes, they provide nitrogen for vegetable crops. But there's one caveat here. Like she said, don't grow food crops. Here's a guide to understanding how nitrogen fiction plants work their magic and how to show them the love in your garden. And how nitrogen fiction works. For planting a cover crop, Gaskin says it helps to understand how light legumes fix nitrogen in the soil. Bacteria with legumes have a symbiotic, mutual, beneficial relationship or rhizobi bacteria. 
little bacteria that infect the goyim roots and exist naturally in the soil casking said now the bacteria are capable are able to do the miraculous conversion by taking nitrogen gas and converting it into a chemical form ammonium the plants can use in return the plant supplies the bacteria with carbohydrates which gives them the energy to function in other words the bacteria gathers nitrogen for the beans and the peas but then the beans and the peas provide the carbohydrates to feed the bacteria. See what I'm saying? It's sort of like what goes on with aphids and ants. You can look that up too. One of the key goals of cover crops, she said, is to keep the living root in the soil at all times. It's how we keep that whole ecosystem down there in the soil growing. Roots exude carbohydrates and other things, and they keep the little microorganisms down there alive and healthy. Oh, and here she said, before planting cover crops, Gaskin urges home gardeners to take an extra step. She likens to an insurance policy to ensure cover crops fulfill their nitrogen fixing role. We recommend that you inoculate your legume seeds with these rhizobi bacteria. Then you know the bacteria is right there when the seeds germinate and is ready to infect the root. Yep, very important. The inoculate is often available where cover crop seeds are sold. And that's why I said you'll see this in your gardening uh, stores or gardening centers, whether it be Lowe's, Home Depot, or what have you, somewhere. You'll have to find it. But it's there because I bought it too. It's to remember when you buy the inoculate that it's a living bacteria. Do not go buy a bag of inoculant and throw it on your dashboard or your car and go run a bunch of errands, she advised. High heat will kill the bacteria. It should be stored in a cool place, such as a refrigerator, until you are ready to use it. While it may seem unnatural to store bacteria with food, it's not going to escape and cause harm. And when I have bought it, I do keep it in the fridge. Growing cover crops also requires gardeners to do something that is unnatural. Yep, kill the plants before they set seed. Yes, sir. That's the important part. But let me tell you something about doing that. Rather than kill the crops, what you can do, and something I'd forgot over 40 some odd years, was that d Grandpa and Daddy used to have us kids and we were a pile of them back then. Between between all of the families, go out and pinch the bean blossoms or pea blossoms off the plants. This was if they were going to be a cover crop, not a food producing crop. Okay, you had to be real careful because one time I got my britches tan because I made the mistake and went in the field that was supposed to be growing beans and they were bush beans to be uh, gathered and canned rather than the field that grandpa said was a cover crop he was not happy <laughs> so the nitrogen that has been fixed from the air into the ground is used to make proteins in the seed to get the most nitrogen form the cover crop it needs to be killed before it sets seed. That's why Laguine food crops don't supply much nitrogen for subsequent crops. There you go. Not much. Still some, but not much. And then it goes in to choosing your cover crops. Popular winter cover crops include crimson clover, which Gaskin called the best clover for the south. Okay. Some others are Australian winter peas, and I planted them in uh, Tennessee, as well as Alabama and Georgia. And as most of you know, if you watch my garden walkabouts, I'm talking about in the spring hairy beds. Because it's a springtime th thing. I let it grow, let it seed, comes back year to year to year. But here's the caveat. I let it seed, let seed fall. The latter, she says, comes with something of a warning. 
In the South, hairy vetch tends to become a weed if you don't kill it for its seed set. Now that's something else I'll talk about here, being this far in deep South. The hairy vetch comes up in the spring. You let it grow. You'll see in that raised bed I got, it was growing. It sort of overcomes everything. It sets its seed. The seed pot burst open, deposits the seed. Then it dies off, which currently, right now, here in June, I think it's June the 5th, it's all browning out and dying. So I can clear that bed out, compost uh, what remains of the hairy vetch, and uh, plant something else. Okay? And it talks about such things as sun hemp and that. And it also talks about soybeans and cowpeas are popular summer cover crops. Well, here again, you can't let them form the beans or the peas. And see, a summer laguine cover crop is something that can enhance the production of fall broccoli, Gaskin said. She suggests planting cow peas at the end of May or June and tilling those in in August when transplants of broccoli, which demands a lot of nitrogen, are set out later in the fall. Cow peas will supply much of the nitrogen to broccoli requires, Gaskin said. Whenever you plant cover crops, Gaskin said, it's important to think about something. She said home gardeners often miss. How are you going to manage your cover crop? It's easy to hand broadcast many cover crop seeds and rake them in. But she pointed out some companion cover crops, such as cereal rye, might have so much biomass that a home gardener has trouble killing it and working it into their garden. You have to think about, how am I going to kill this thing? How am I going to till it in? Before you get out there and plant something that may give you more biomass, then you can manage with a little tiller. So it goes into managing cover crops, mixing and matching the greens and grains, and what have you, and also talks about or ornamental gardens and lawns and about the fact that all plants give back. And the other thing to remember, she said, is that all plants give back in some way, whether it's through the beauty of flowers or pollinators they support or in more personal way. She recalled how she grew cut flowers for her daughter's wedding. This summer, zinnias, purple cone flowers, rose yard, black-eyed season. To get them to keep blooming, I had to keep harvesting the flowers. A friend of mine, and I would take them to the food bank and make bouquets for folks. Okay? But let me tell you something about beans. And this is good for bush beans, pole beans, or southern peas. And like I said, I remember this from my childhood. And that, uh, especially in the gardens, not so much farms. Uh, and my dad actually come up with a unique way to handle this later on in life. I think it was in my teen years. But they'd send us out because they knew these things. They knew that if we allowed the beans or peas to start forming pods, a.k.a. green beans or soybeans or peas, it didn't matter what type, black eye or purple hole, that uh, the nitrogen production would all go into the seeds, as we discussed during this video. So what they would have us do is go through the, every so often, every two or three days, find every bean, pea, blossom out there and pinch it off. Yep. In fact, my dad was so anal about it, he had him put us had him put us in one gallon paint bucket and bring them back home. So he knew we were doing what we were sent out to do. Now, later on in life, when I'd left home, and somehow he wasn't so big on forcing my brother below me and my sister, and of course, my baby sister, which is 12 years younger than me in doing this, he came up with an idea that I have used. Also, I forgot about it. He took a set of hedge trimmers, electric, and they were cord. They weren't cordless. And he'd go there as soon as he saw the blossoms coming on bean plants, pea plants, 
he'd go through with those hedge trimmers just low enough to cut the tops off. Therefore, cutting off all the blossoms as well. Because he knew, just like I know, and like I've told y'all in many garden walkabouts, that the beans will re-sprout from the leaf crotches. Remember? I have a video, I think something about title. Do you prune your green beans? But I do. It actually works. So you can do that too. So there's many ways to maximize your nitrogen production using the greens, beans and peas. With that exception, if you're planning on harvesting the bean, whether I'll be it be green bean, dried bean, green peas, or dried peas, or fresh peas, then you're going to have to either cut them totally down before they set the beans or peas, or you're going to have to manage them, say, using those uh, hedge trimmers to keep off the blossoms. And they will keep, continue to respout and form nodules of that nitrogen if, in fact, you have inoculated your seed with that bacteria inocula. So I hope you learned something today. Now, I know this was rather lengthy and long-winded, but I like to make sure you know the facts. So, if you stayed this long, now do you understand whether it's a myth or a fact? Well, it's not cut and dry. Indeed, the greens and peas will add nitrogen to your soil. Are they going to add enough nitrogen for anything else you're going to plant if you harvest the beans and peas? Well, that's quite obvious. With 80% going into the beans and the peas, not much is left behind. And far even less is left behind if you pull the plants up and throw them away or compost them. Now, if you laid them down on the soil where they were, and went ahead and killed them on in, or even let them lay there and decompose till the next season, you'd be getting 20% maximum. If you pull them up and tote them off, you ain't getting nothing, if anything, except what roots broke off, and did they have nodules or not. Here again, all gets back to inoculation. And I ain't picking on Froggy. I love Froggy to death. That's Michael. Up at Frogfoot Holler. And I'll give Michael credit where credit's due. he got a lot going on there. He's got some substantial gardens. And he knows a lot about gardening. And he has all my respect and admiration. Just like old uh, Teresa. i got to call her out first. Because basically Les is just a helper. Mostly a cameraman, but you know, I know he helped some too. Over there at Lone Star Pioneer. And then there's another channel that um, I watch and are friends with. And that's Southern Boy Prepper down there in uh, Louisiana. He's got a garden going on. This is his second year and he's learning as he goes. Him, his wife Kelly. He's got his daughter Zoe. And he's got... Devin, his son, and he's got Miley, along with a whole passel of chickens. I mean, he got a group of chickens. He's got like a herd. He ain't got a flock. He done went past flock to herd. And, of course, they got more cats, the likes of which you could swap with a feather duster. But they got it going on. Way more than old Mr. Tom. You know, Mr. Tom ain't doing much this year. Because I had to change my focus. But I thought, as we go along, and when I see these things pop up on social media that may be totally correct or maybe not quite, I might do a video and tell you more about them in depth. So, if you like this type of video and you would want me to do specific videos on garden fact or garden myth, let me know in the comments. If you just like me sort of give you a little synopsis when I'm doing my garden walkabouts this year, 
which is how normally I've handled it in past years, but it does make it hard to look up the information from my videos because I don't have specifics like I'm going to do now. See? Because now the title of this will be Garden Factor Myth. Do Laguines and Peas add sufficient soil to your ground after growing? So you'll be able to, you know, type in the search part, search bar there on my channel. Something like add nitrogen or nitrogen. <laughs> the video will just pop right up. Just that simple. Anyway. In the comments below, you let me know. And I hope you did enjoy the video. And you may have heard from time to time tricks. You know, she's aggravated and impatient because it's about feeding time. So, until I see you all on the next video, y'all take care out there. Stay safe. Take all precautions that you know you should. Get plenty of rest. Eat right. And may God bless you, your family, friends, and loved ones. Tell old Trixie, Gracie, Cleo sometimes now, Spooky always, and occasionally we'll get a glimpse of Speedy, and on occasion, Elrod and McGee. See y'all on the next video, okay? And with that said, goodbye for now. Later on.